Hi, my name is Dr. Swarnabha Roy, and uh, I'll be explaining uh, the reabsorption of salt and water at the loop of Henley, um, and we'll talk about the triple transporter that is present, and the significance of diuretic drugs. So the keywords are Henley's loop, triple transporter, and the diuretic drugs. Now, this is the second part of the lecture, the first part of the lecture where I talk about the reabsorption of salt and different kinds of transports in the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, that's in the first part and you can click on the link and you can go to the first part and listen to my lecture for the PCT or the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, a basic, a brief uh, explanation of how the, the, the kidney looks like. Uh, you can see that there is the outer lighter strip the outer area which is called the renal cortex and then you have the inner darker medulla okay uh, and uh, below you can see the picture of a nephron and the nephron has most part of the nephron is in the cortex uh, but the Henley's loop or the loop of Henley that is present in the medulla you can see the how the Henley's loop dips in the medulla and it goes back to the cortex so that red box it shows the, the loop of Henley dipping into the medulla of the kidney and then again the later part of the nephron which is the distal convoluted tubule is again back in the cortex now so this is the loop of Henley okay and uh, the loop of Henley has a thick descending loop and then there is a thin descending loop and then on the right side you have a thin ascending loop and then you have a thick ascending loop and you can see that the cortex which is the outer part of the kidney and then we have the outer medulla okay and then we have the inner medulla on the left corner you can see and then we have the interstitium uh, which is on the right corner okay now remember the inside of the loop of Henley is the lumen where the urine is formed and passed out of the body the blood vessels are present in the interstitium side now the loop of Henley is very much permeable to water so water keeps going out of the loop of Henley and enters the interstitium okay so you can see that water keeps going out so it's, it's, it's very permeable to water now as the water leaves the loop of Henley and enters the interstitium what's happening is it's getting the the inside of the lumen it's becoming less dilute because it's losing water in other words the solute concentration becomes higher inside the lumen compared to the interstitium now when something is very dilute the osmolality that OSM value is low as it loses water and as the solute concentration starts increasing the OSM value or the osmolality starts increasing and that's what exactly happened as water escapes from the lumen the osmolality of the lumen increases since the interstitium gets more and more diluted so it's losing water as we go down from the thick descending loop to the thin descending loop water keeps going out of the loop of Henley into the interstitium and you see that the how the osmolality is increasing from 400 to 600 so as water continues to lose the osmolality gets higher and higher as we descend down the loop of Henley and then you know it goes up to 900 and then finally it reaches 1200 OSM where the osmolality increase stops that means no more water is going to come out from the lumen to the interstitium side now 
Now, as we enter the ascending loop, okay, we were talking about the descending loop all the time. Now, as we enter the ascending loop, it becomes permeable to sodium chloride and it stops being permeable to water. So, the ascending loop is not permeable to water anymore. It's now permeable to sodium chloride. You can see that how sodium chloride is now leaving the lumen and entering the interstitium. Finally, we move to the thick ascending loop. Okay? Now, the thick ascending loop is where we have the triple transporter, which is probably the most important part of the loop of Henle. Now, the triple transporter, why it's called triple transporter? And, 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 and we, we're going to show you that, so that red thing is the blood vessel. So you have to understand that this is the, 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 the lumen and the interstitium side has the blood vessel. So anything that leaves the lumen, it enters the epithelial cells and then from the epithelial cells, any kind of solute, any kind of ion enters the blood vessels. That's why the blood vessel is also shown so that you don't understand how things are physiologically arranged in the, the renal system. So, triple transporter. So, sodium first gets inside from the lumen to the epithelial cells and then potassium gets inside and look how potassium is now entering uh, into the blood vessels via the epithelial cells. Okay, so it's been taken back by the blood vessels and then we have the chloride so that's why it's called triple transporter because sodium potassium and chloride they are sucked inside the epithelial cells and into the blood vessels from the lumen side you see there again chloride is entering the blood vessels and then now these round transporters are the ATPases that means these are active transport when I say active, I mean that energy is required while taking in these ions. Energy in the form of ATP is, is utilized to take in sodium, potassium, and chloride. Okay, and you see there sodium again entering the blood vessel. Now, potassium, although potassium is taken inside uh, the epithelial cells from the lumen side, the, the, the funny thing is that potassium also enters the epithelial cells from the blood vessels into the lumen. So potassium, there's a two-way traffic. Potassium is coming inside from the lumen side and potassium is also coming inside from the blood vessel. And there is a higher concentration, there's an accumulation of potassium ion in the epithelial cells so the potassium builds and builds and then it moves out and accumulates in the lumen. So you see, so, uh, so there's a little channel which is permeable to the potassium. You see those black two bars. So that channel, via that channel, potassium ion, which builds up inside the epithelial cell, it escapes into the lumen. Okay. And as it does that, as this thing happens, this creates a strong electrochemical gradient and it causes reabsorption of calcium ion and magnesium ion in the thick ascending loop. So, potassium builds up, goes outside into the lumen side and this creates an electrochemical gradient which is sucking in, bringing in calcium and magnesium. So, you see again how calcium and magnesium ions are then taken inside the epithelial cells into the blood vessels. Okay. Now, so we have an active sodium, potassium, and chloride transporter, and a passive magnesium and calcium created by potassium. So you have to understand this taking in, taking in of this magnesium and the calcium, it's not active transport, it's passive transport. There's no energy required, there's no ATP, okay? Calcium and magnesium ions come inside in exchange of potassium that is going outside. Okay, so there is no energy, it's not an active, it's a passive transport. Okay, now, now one thing we need to understand is about now we can start the diuretic drug part. Okay, now 
two kinds of diuretic, the furosemide and the ethacrylic acid, ethacrylic acid and the furosemide. These are prescribed by doctors to patients who have hypertension. Okay, so these diuretic drugs are called the loop diuretics. Okay, uh, so why it's called loop? Because it functions selectively in the Henle's loop. They, these diuretic drugs, they don't function in the proximal convoluted tubule. They are specific for the loop of Henle because they block the triple transporter. You see that these drugs, they are blocking the triple transporter. They are blocking the entry of sodium, potassium, and two chloride ions inside the epithelial cells from the lumen side. So, so they block the triple transporter. Now, what happens when sodium, potassium, and chloride are blocked, there is accumulation of sodium, potassium, and chloride on the lumen side. So the lumen side becomes more concentrated in terms of solute. Now, as we know that water, it moves from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. So in this case, there will be movement of water from the blood vessels via the epithelial cells into the lumen. So the blood vessels, which are hyper, which, which are filled with water, and that's that, that water is causing the hypertension, right? So the blood vessels will lose the water because the solute concentration is high on the lumen side because sodium and ion, potassium ion, and chloride ion are not being able to enter the epithelial cells because they are blocked by the diuretic drugs, the loop diuretic drugs. And as the blood vessels lose water, the hypertension comes down. There is no more pressure on the vessels. Blood loses water and the hypertension drops. That's the whole purpose of these diuretic drugs. So, so that's why the treatment, why are diuretic drugs given to patients to treat hypertension? That's the primary reason why they're given. And also for congestive heart failure, okay? But that, so, so congestive heart failure leads to edema. So edema is again a swelling because of there's water. So to reduce that edema, to reduce the edema, diuretic drugs are prescribed to patients and these patients, they lose water, they do a lot of, lot of urination, they pee a lot, okay? Once you start having diuretic drugs, you start peeing a lot, and, and um, in that process, you lose water from the body, and so the edema goes down, the hypertension goes down. And also, it's prescribed to diabetes, diabetic people, people with patients with kidney, liver disease, and, and, and even diabetic patients, kidney, liver disease patients, they, they, have, they form a lot of edema. So, so that's why the diuretic drugs are used to remove water, sodium, and potassium from the body. Now, there's a syndrome called the Barter syndrome. Now, the Barter syndrome, it, what happens is that uh, the, the gene which makes proteins for the triple transporter, that gene is mutated. So, in other words, the sodium, potassium, and the chloride, this, this, uh, this um, triple transporter, this pump is ineffective in people with Barter syndrome. So, so what happens? So, so, these people, they don't need a diuretic drug because their triple transporter is always ineffective. Since it's, it's inborn ineffective, these people, they always have a huge volume of urination. They pee a lot. It seems as if these people are always on diuretic drugs because the triple transporter doesn't function for them. And that's why if, if, you, if you take a patient with Barter syndrome, these patients, they always have a low BP, a low blood pressure. So the BP for these mutated individuals are usually low. Now, Barter syndrome, or loop diuretics. So a patient who, who has a mutation for the triple transporter, um, you know, uh, the ATPAs, you know, these patients with the Barter syndrome and the pe people with loop diuretics, they have 
an ineffective sodium, potassium, and chloride. So basically, they have low blood pressure. So that is the whole purpose of the loop diuretics. That's a good thing about the people with Bartos syndrome that, 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 that these guys will never develop hypertension. But the bad thing is, is you are not letting sodium, potassium, and chloride ions to enter, right? If you treat a patient with diuretic drugs, they, you're blocking it. You're blocking the sodium, the triple transporter. So, so these ions are getting accumulated in the lumen. And the same thing is happening with, with, with patients with Bartos syndrome because they have a mutated triple transporter. So what that, what that causes is there is lowering of chloride ion inside the epithelial cells and there is also lowering of potassium ions inside the epithelial cells and lowering of potassium ion causes hypokalemia okay and there is also lowering of sodium ion inside the epithelial cells of, of, of the of, of the loop of Henle um, and then the lowering of sodium ion causes hyponatremia now this hypokalemia this hypokalemia it's 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 a condition which the body doesn't want to be the body doesn't want to be in a hypokalemic state the body doesn't want to have low potassium ion inside the epithelial cells so to counteract that thing in order to increase the potassium ion what body does is body starts taking in potassium ion from the lumen side you see so people so patients who are on diuretic drugs and those who have the Bardo syndrome these people what happens since they have low potassium in their epithelial cells hypokalemia hypokalemia leads to absorption of potassium from the lumen side into the epithelial cells in exchange of an hydrogen ion so hydrogen leaves the lumen enters the lumen and the potassium ion enters the epithelial cell so what happens is that excess loss of hydrogen ion occurs okay so this condition is called metabolic alkalosis why alkalosis because hydrogen ion is being lost from the epithelial cells so these epithelial cells are now you know basic in nature you know because it's losing hydrogen ion so it's more alkaline the epithelial cells are more alkaline in nature this is called metabolic alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis is a common side effect for patients using diuretic drugs and with or and with people and in people who have Bartos syndrome metabolic alkalosis is a, a, a problem and and alkalosis you know that it, it, it when alkalosis sets in when when our kidneys become very basic and very alkaline in nature the patients they have nausea they have numbness they have uh, prolonged muscle spasms and and they have muscle twitching and they have tremor in the hand the hand keeps shaking so these are the side effects of uh, diuretic drugs these are the things that happen in in patients with Bartos syndrome I hope you uh, found my um, lecture uh, for the Loop of Henley um, informative. And uh, please visit my website www.swarnavaroypac.com. And um, I give regular lectures over Skype. So if you have any problems understanding your coursework, um, please contact me. Everything is there in the website. Um, I can guarantee you good grades, which many of my students have received. Um, I also help with assignments. Okay, if you have any assignments which you are having hard time, I can I can do it for you. I can help you uh, do the assignment, and even during your exam time, I can help you to prepare for your exam so you can get good grades. So please visit my website, and there are tons of information, uh, all my contact details, and everything. You know, uh, all the best. Uh, bye bye.